do valve surgeries, I do ventricular assist devices, you know, the device that Dick Cheney has had, uh, I do surgeries on the aorta, and I also have uh, an area of very strong interest that I'd like to share with you. Uh, it relates to transcatheter heart valves, and it's a brand new technology that's very promising for patients. <clears throat> what I want to do during the course uh, of this evening is first discuss a little bit about valvular heart disease and what it is and what it means, uh, how, how prevalent is it, what are some of the clinical aspects, uh, and, and what are the treatment options? What do we do currently and what's on the horizon and, and, and what are we growing towards? Here we have a cut section through a heart. It's a schematic, but you see these are four valves that are cut through here. Okay, this is the mitral valve. The heart has four valves. This is the tricuspid valve. Aortic valve, which is what we'll be focusing mostly on, and this is the pulmonic valve. And you see they sit in very close proximity to each other. The aortic valve, which is going to be sort of the main topic of conversation, although I will discuss the mitral valve as well, is sort of the doorway that sits between the heart and the rest of the body. It has three flaps or doors, and they open and close with every single heartbeat. The function of this valve is that Blood comes from the lungs with oxygen, goes to the heart. Your heart's a muscle. It pumps the blood as hard as it can across those doors, and the blood goes to your arms and your legs and your head to oxygenate your cells. The door has to open to let that happen, and then it closes so the blood doesn't go backwards down back into the heart at the end of the heartbeat. <clears throat> and all of these valves, including the aortic valve that I just mentioned, have failure mechanisms, just from wear and tear, from infection, from rheumatic disease, and that's what keeps us in business. When you develop symptoms from those, uh, you need surgery. And as you can see, almost 100,000 cases are performed yearly here in the United States. Uh, here in New York State, more specifically, we do upwards of 20,000 operations a year, and of those, roughly 50% are for diseases of the valves of the heart. So it's a very common procedure. What types of things do you feel? What brings you to the doctor when you have symptoms? What are the symptoms that you have with valvular heart disease? All of the valves can give you symptoms that are somewhat similar. You might feel fatigue, generalized weakness. You may feel like you've never sort of caught up on your sleep. You might uh, uh, go for a walk and you notice that you're not doing the 10 blocks you did last year. Uh, um, you might develop shortness of breath, either very rapidly with exercise or movement, or really just in the sitting position, reclined position, watching television. You might feel your heart race, you might develop some palpitations, you can develop chest pain, uh, you can stand up and feel lightheaded and even pass out from some diseases of the heart valves. You can develop significant swelling of your legs. And you sometimes you may not have any symptoms at all, your doctor might pick it up at the, uh, in the office with a murmur on exam. If someone has these symptoms or they do have a murmur, what do you do for them? Well, you see your doctor, you get a complete physical exam to help figure out which valve might be affected, you do the usual blood work evaluation, you do an EKG to look at the heart rhythm to make sure that's okay, and you do an echocardiogram, which is essentially an ultrasound of the heart. And when you do an ultrasound of the heart, you can see how well those valves are all opening and closing. If there is a problem with the valves, and they can leak, or they can be too tight. There are two different problems that you can have with the valves. Then, if, Or if you have swelling in the ankles or some shortness of breath, you can take a water pill to help treat it. You might need some blood pressure control, some heart rate control. And at a certain point, which is well defined, you might need surgical intervention if the valve is of a certain size and your symptoms are a certain way. Now, classically, for over 50 years of, of cardiac surgery, valve uh, surgical procedures have been performed using some combination of what I'm showing you here. Either you replace the valve and you use one of these valves where you take out the native valve that just isn't working anymore and you replace it with one, or you repair it. You fix it, you tighten it, you do what you have to do with a stitch here and a stitch there to fix the hinge or whatever is missing from the door. Uh, and we've done that for many years. When we do that operation though, we do need to use the heart-lung machine. And the heart-lung machine is very safe. And what the heart-lung machine basically does is it bypasses the blood flow to the heart and takes over the job of the heart 
while we're able to, so that we can operate on the valve. Here's what the heart machine looks like. It's sort of a rudimentary concept in that it just pulls the blood out before it gets to the heart, cycles through some tubes, and comes back to your body in the aorta just beyond where the heart would eject it. So that the blood is a clear field. You don't, uh, the heart is in a clear field. It's not pumping. You can work on it, and you don't have to rely on its function. That's cardiopulmonary bypass. Here's an example of what they do. I hope it's not too graphic. Here's a patient, the sternum breastbone is open. The heart has been stopped so that we could operate on it. Here's a tube full of blood that's taken the blood out of the body, circulating it through that uh, uh, bypass machine that I showed you. It comes around and the patient's head is on this side, the feet are on this side. Comes back and drops the blood back off in the aorta. And in the meantime, we're bypassing this area where we're working. The heart isn't working. The valve, this is an aortic valve was very tight, we took it out, and we've replaced it with a, a valve that's made out of cow tissue. These are all the sutures that we use to tie. If you took a picture in 10 minutes, you'd see that all these were sutures that were tied down and had a lot of knots in them. And then this is a cut through the ascending aorta, we close that up, take all this out, take the tubes out, the heart takes over, except now it has a brand new doorway there that allows for excellent pumping of the blood. As I mentioned, sometimes we just repair the valve. Sometimes the valve doors are okay, it just needs a little tightening. Here's an example of a mitral valve. One door here, one door back here, except the leaflets aren't coming together. They're supposed to meet in the middle. This heart was slightly enlarged, and because of that, the valve leaflets aren't meeting, and when the valve leaflets don't meet, they leak. And the leaking can cause some of the symptoms we talked about. The treatment for this particular problem is what I showed you before, which is just a repair, tightening that. If you see in the corner here, we have a, a polyester band that we've sewn around this valve to sort of tighten it so that the point of apposition is now restored. Here's what it looks like at the end of the operation. We have an incision, we have a few tubes, we have some pacing wires. This is sort of the standard uh, fair operation. You're in the hospital about a week. Here's a smaller incision that we did for someone who had a specific type of anatomy. You see it's only a few centimeters long. This is how it looks after it heals. And if I took a picture in six months from this picture, you wouldn't even really notice the scar. Now again, we've been doing these types of operations for 50 years, and if you look at the data, the data is very good as it pertains specifically to the aortic valve. Over years and years and years, we've essentially perfected the operation. The operative mortality, even though we cracked the chest and stop the heart and do all this, uh, the operative mortality is very low. And it's run very low for a very long time. However, it still is a couple percent. And that couple percent ends up coming from patients who we're pushing the limits on. If we leave the valve alone, we know it's, the patient will succumb to it. If we operate, we know the recovery will be tough because it is an operation after all. And so, what we've developed over the past decade, essentially, is a minimally invasive alternative to the open heart approach in hopes of decreasing, allowing for better options and better selection so that the operative mortality comes down for the open heart procedure and we provide a new operation for patients who are higher risk for that. And we started the conversation by showing all the valves of the heart and there are new techniques around that are not open heart surgery techniques for all of the valve positions that we talked about. I'm gonna take another step back. Now I talked about what, you know, the, the new technology, but I wanna talk a little bit about the drivers. I've sort of alluded to the clinical driver, I'll get back to that. But just in general terms, the economics of healthcare, we're all very aware of. Healthcare spending is going through the roof, it's skyrocketing, we're working on reining it in, and you know, certainly as a percentage of G GDP, there's nothing higher. But We've done a lot of studies on this, and, and we know that cardiovascular, really technological innovation in medicine reaps rewards. When you spend money on, on, on health care for patients, you get a return in deaths prevented, in quality of life, in readmissions prevented. In addition to that, technological improvements have actually saved health care dollars. When you can do a procedure faster, or in a way that prevents patients from being in the hospital for three weeks. That yields benefits in terms of healthcare spending. A great example of that, for example, is aspirin. 
the use of aspirin for patients who have heart disease has significantly reduced healthcare costs. The same with Lipitor, the same with beta blockers, okay, to treat heart conditions and to reduce heart rates. When you come up with a good technology and a good medication for heart disease, you avoid problems that can be very expensive. So that, that's a piece about the economic, you know, the healthcare side. Uh, it's, it's worth mentioning the clinical side. It's a reality that America's aging, okay? This is not a surprise to you, but right now we're getting close to about 50 million Americans who are above the age of 65, and that number is only going to increase with time. You know, with that, inevitably, particularly since some of these problems come with wear and tear on the heart valves, we are going to end up finding ourselves where we have situations uh, that are diseases of the heart valves that come up more frequently. I mentioned this. I bring up this slide to mention a very important point. So often in my practice, I have a patient who comes to my office and says, "You know, doctor, though, you know, I'm, I'm 76 years old. I'm 78 years old. Is this really appropriate for me?" You know, I say, "Look at your quality of life." You're walking to the grocery every day, you spend every afternoon at the library, you get to see your grandkids, you do this, you do that. I don't care about your chronological age. It's your physiology, and your physiology is great. If you want to continue to do that, you proceed. And oftentimes, even patients have barriers to that concept. Oh, you know, but actually, if you're active and doing things, there's no reason not to proceed, and that's what we look at. We don't turn down patients just because, oh, you know, the, the uh, birth certificate says that they're 95 years old. And we've done lots of patients who are 95 years old. <clears throat> I said I'd mention a little bit about the demographics of disease. When it comes to diseases of the mitral valve, about 2 to 3% of the population has some degree of mitral valve prolapse. Of these patients, okay, there are mild forms, moderate forms, severe forms, about 5% at a steady state have severe mitral regurgitation, which means that a severe leak of the valve that sits between the lungs and the heart. That is going to cause symptoms for patients. Of that number, about a percent of the total are high-risk surgical candidates, meaning open-heart surgery can be done, but it's going to be high risk. There are real, real risks there because, you know, the kidneys aren't great, because there's a history of uh, you know, COPD or asthma or something else. And some patients, upwards of a percent, are really high risk and not even surgical candidates. We don't think that their kidneys can tolerate an operation. We don't think that their lungs can tolerate an operation. Same thing applies to the aortic valve. With the aortic valve, again, in just in the population greater than 65, approximately 1.5 million people have some degree of aortic stenosis. It's a pretty prevalent disease. It only becomes a real factor when it's severe, meaning the valve is very tight. And approximately 180,000, 200,000 people are out there with a very tight aortic valve in that population greater than 65. And of that 180,000, there are probably about 60,000 people who a surgeon, a physician, a cardiologist, a primary care doctor would say is too high risk to undergo surgery. And that's a particularly big problem because there is no treatment other than surgery when the valve is severely tight. So if you have a severely tightened valve and it continues to get worse and you don't think you're a candidate for open heart surgery, what do you do? And that, that's been a problem for the past 50 years. But that also Aside from the economic driver for advancements technologically, the clinical driver has been to help people in this cohort who are operation is too much for, but who have a problem that needs to be fixed. So we introduced this concept of a transcatheter heart valve. It provides replacement of the valves, except it's less invasive, meaning it doesn't require the cardiopulmonary bypass machine. It's not a sternal split procedure. Um, it's much more conducive to a quick recovery because of those factors. It may be more cost effective, but very importantly, it can be made available by virtue of these attributes to a very wide population of people. I'll give you an example of, of what we do for the mitral valve, minimally invasively. Here's a mitral valve again, there are two leaflets. This is again the valve that sits between the lungs and, and the heart. Here's one leaflet, here's another leaflet. 
This valve has attachments. You can see these attachments that anchor the valve to the heart. Occasionally from infection or from wear and tear, those attachments can rupture. When they rupture, the valve doesn't close. The ruptured portion just flails around. The blood goes backwards to the lungs, you get shorter breath. A procedure that we can do for this closes that gap between those two leaflets so that now we, call, we have what we call a double orifice repair. When the blood needs to pass, these two holes open up, the blood gets through. When the valve needs to close, these two portions where the attachments are intact close and prevent the backflow of blood. That's a surgical procedure. From a catheter standpoint, we were able to replicate this. Here's a clip, sort of like a staple or a paper clip that you place right in the middle here and you clip this area closed with the catheter instead of making a sternal incision without using the heart-lung machine. It's called an e-valve clip. Here's how we introduce it into the body. It comes around through the, with this large catheter. It comes out in the open position. We position it. This is the mitral valve. And then when we grab the leaflets in the middle, we close it and staple those two portions together. Here's what it looks like. This is a section through a, uh, a pig heart, but you see it heals just fine. You can see the resemblance. This is one orifice. This is the other orifice. Opens and closes normally. You eliminate the leaking valve. And what's so powerful about that is that, again, no, no cardiopulmonary bypass, no sternal split, very quick healing. Now you have patients who are high risk and inoperable who now have an option. Here are some examples of what we do for the aortic position when the aortic valve is very tight. <clears throat> if you remember, I don't want to go back to it now, but I showed you pictures of what the valves look like when we implant them surgically. This is a very similar valve, except it's on a stainless steel stent. It's a sutureless technique. We take this valve on the stainless steel stent, we stick it on the tip of a balloon here, we crimp it real tight, and we pass it with a catheter from the groin up into the aortic valve position and deploy it. And I thought I'd show you. Um, do you know how to do this? Yeah, I don't see the mouse. Oh, there it is. I think you'll like the animation. I'll go through it for you. So what we're going to demonstrate right now, this is a beating heart. And I'm going to, we're going to see a, a, a valve. This is the aortic valve. It's a tri-leaflet valve, three doors, and it's heavily calcified. All this ribbing and ridging is calcium deposits on the valve that prevent it from opening and closing appropriately. I showed you pictures of what the standard treatment is. It's open heart surgery, but here's the alternative. Pass a wire through the artery of the leg, all the way up to the heart. We get across this valve. And then once we have the valve in place, we come up with a balloon we bring a balloon across the valve and we stretch the valve open. Once we stretch the valve open, we've made some room to pass in our, our stented valve. <clears throat> we bring in our sheath, which is the blue here, and through the sheath, we pass that valve, that stainless steel uh, stent valve, that's crimped on a balloon. We bring it all the way around the aorta all the way down to the base of the heart here and what we're going to do is during a period of rapid pacing on the heart we're going to now inflate that balloon and this time instead of just stretching the valve we're leaving behind a new one. Hmm. Sutureless technique you saw all the sutures that I used in the open heart case in the picture before and in this procedure just through a small puncture in the groin we introduce a brand new valve that opens and closes normally. This is three leaflets on the valve and you see it's pushed away the old valve and now you have a wide open valve that won't give you symptoms and will take away the symptoms that you would have otherwise. And again, if you think about the number of people out there at a steady state who are either high risk or inoperable from a surgical standpoint, this is a great opportunity and possibility. And now just to prove to you that 
This is not uh, just science fiction. Um, let's see what I can do here. I'm going to try to see if I can get this to play. Is there a trick that I'm missing here? Well, I'd like you to see it. That's, that's the valve it's, as it's deployed, but I do have... Spend forever loading this. Let's see if this one works. Okay, so what we're seeing here, and it doesn't really matter if uh, if it if it runs, but just as you saw in the animation, the catheter is coming up around the aorta. The heart is over here. This is an X-ray image of it. This is where the valve is, the bad valve. We've brought our crimped valve, which is this rectangle right here, across the bad valve. And during a period of rapid pacing, we inflate the balloon and boom. Now we have the valve expanded and pushed out of the way as the patient's old native valve. And we do it all again through the groin, through a catheter in the groin with no incisions. So now recovery is faster, recovery is better, it's available to more people and more patients. We have other approaches to this. It doesn't only have to be done through the groin. If the groin vessels are too small, if someone has peripheral vascular disease, we can go directly through the heart through an incision on the side, maybe four centimeter incision, no big deal. I'll show you that one. This is an altern alternate approach to achieve the same result. The prior approach was through the groin. <clears throat> this approach is gonna be through the, uh, directly through the side of the chest into the heart. Again, we have an old calcified valve, it's barely opening, that's giving a lot of symptoms. And with time, by the way, it only gets worse. <clears throat> we make an incision on the side, we pinpoint an area on the apex of the heart, which is the point uh, of the heart. We put some sutures there, and now it's a straight shot. It's a short distance. Straight shot up to the valve with a wire, okay? Then we go ahead and do that. We put a sheath in there, this big blue tube that sits right in the heart. Okay, now we pass a balloon again through there to just open the valve up to stretch it out. Take the balloon out. And again, now we have a valve that's crimp tight. We pass it into the right position across the patient's native valve, and then we deploy it, leaving behind the new valve and having pushed aside the patient's native old valve. And now we, again, have perfect hinges, a good size orifice, and a well-functioning valve. And see if this works. See, my goal was to show you the animation and then just to prove that it's, I'm not crazy, show you a real life case. But I, this is an example, for whatever reason, the, uh, the angiograms aren't coming through. Um, this is an example where we approach the heart directly through the side in a patient whose arteries are too small. And it's a direct shot. Again, the patient's native valve is here. Here's the valve as it sits, and then it, it opens up in the same way. So it's less invasive. You don't need cardiopulmonary bypass. It's absolutely, definitely available to a wider range of patients. It's conducive to a much quicker recovery. And it may be much more cost effective when you take into account things like shorter hospital stays, fewer admissions to the hospital in heart failure in patients who don't have other therapies. Okay? Now, 
I want to talk about the results a little bit. We began to study this uh, device uh, in 2007. We studied it initially in patients who were inoperable, who had no other alternative, and you saw that it was about a couple hundred thousand people a year. And looking at it in those patients, we found that it was a home run. It doubled the survival versus medical therapy because there is no real medical therapy for, for patients who have aortic stenosis. Doubled the survival just at one year. You know, anyone here who's familiar with outcomes related to chemotherapy and things like that, as a medical community, we'll take a 1% benefit. 1%, we'll take it. This regimen is 2% better than that one. We abandon that one and go with the new one. We're looking for any percent we can get. This was double the benefit. Okay, so home run for patients who had no other alternative. It goes without saying, really. Then we looked at this in patients who are very high risk for surgery, meaning the operative mortality was about 15%. We looked at it in those patients, we compared it to surgery, and guess what? Equal. Equal in terms of survival at a year, but recovery time was twice as fast. So now we have a therapy where recovery is, is faster and the survival is the same in high-risk patients. Now, what we're currently, in, and so now the FDA has approved it. The FDA said, no question about it, this is a very adequate therapy, it's minimally invasive, patients get out of the hospital quickly, and now it's available commercially. I can, you know, pull one off the shelf now, it doesn't have to be through a clinical trial anymore, and provide that therapy for my patients given that they're high, if they're high risk or inoperable. We're currently involved in studies in patients who are intermediate risk. Patients whose risk of surgery is 5%. Are they still a reasonable group to use this device in? Well, it's less invasive, the recovery is fast. If patients who are inoperable did well, odds are patients who are operable with lower risk will do well too. The only catch is, we don't know the durability yet. You know, it's only been around for a few years. Is it possible, you know, even though we're using cow tissue and pig tissue just like we use for the surgical valves, is it possible that when you crimp it tight and expand it with a balloon and have it on a stent, is it possible that it's not as durable as it would be if it were implanted surgically? It's possible. And not to mention, we have 50 years of data for surgical valves. So we better be darn sure that if we start implanting these valves that they don't start wearing out at three, four, five years. And so we're working on the durability now. We have no reason to think that it's not durable, by the way. I'm just, you know, talking through the, the testing and how it stands at the moment. So, <clears throat> again, just going back to our images of the valves, we talked about the mitral valve and the clip that you can use there like a staple. We talked about the aortic valve, which has been a big boom and big help clinically to patients. But we actually have treatments that are minimally invasive for the tricuspid valve, for the pulmonic valve, all the valves of the heart. And we're only dealing with the first or second generation devices at this point. We've got a long way to go. The devices can get smaller. They can uh, be easier to deploy. Uh, length of stay in the hospital will be reduced. Patients will, you know, they can be more durable. Access routes can be made more simple. Um, there's a lot of innovation left on the horizon for this. But what's super exciting about it is that we've been at a point where we've had open heart surgery for 50 years doing the procedure one way, and there have definitely been groups of people who haven't been able, we haven't been able to help with it. But this definitely provides that, and the results have been so good that there's a chance within the next 10 years that it might replace what we do surgically altogether. And we sort of see that, that time coming. You know, in, in surgery, we always see sort of a trade-off between, you know, invasiveness and efficacy. You know, it's, it's easy to make a real big incision and, and to be very maximally invasive. And in terms of the overall result, you get, you get a good result. You can see everything, you can suture everything. And, and I would say that, you know, the, the problem is that while it might be very efficacious, um, uh, you know, if it's, if it's um, less invasive, then you have less morbidity of the procedure. And if it's more invasive, you have more morbidity, you know. You, everyone remembers the days when gallbladders were performed with a foot-long incision, and then 20, and actually 30 years ago now, we were able to do them laparoscopically. Patients suddenly went from going home in two weeks to going home in two days. That was a huge advance. It went from much 
more invasive to much less invasive, and because it was less morbid, patients went home quickly, and it was very efficacious, equally efficacious. Conventional heart surgery is maximally invasive, sort of by definition, uh, but it's very efficacious. I mean, we, we get great results doing it. We've perfected the operation. Transcatheter valves are certainly much less invasive, but, you know, we're still working on getting it, you know, uh, as efficacious as possible for as many patients as we can. And by making the catheters smaller and making the approaches uh, uh, easier, making them even less invasive than they currently are. So that at some point we'll be in a situation where we'll be minimally invasive and maximally efficacious, which is really where we're heading in a very rapid fashion. So I want to thank you. It's a very exciting topic. I'm sure everyone here knows people who've had open heart surgery in some way, shape, or form. And it's nice that we have alternatives available for patients. Thank you. That's fascinating. Have you done many of these? Yes. So, uh, you know, we've been fortunate here that, uh, in that we've been involved with the clinical trials from the very start. So we've been doing these for about six years now. We've probably done, I don't know, hundreds uh, of these procedures, and, and fortunately we've had great results. Everything I reported to you is really consistent with our own findings. From my personal standpoint, it's very nice because I can say to a patient, well, look, I have tried and true results for 50 years on the surgical approach. I can provide you that option, or I can provide you a catheter option. Either way, you get your valve fix, which is the most important thing. You know. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, that's a reason to do this. If you, well, if you have congestive heart failure from the valve, if you have congestive heart failure as a result of a valve problem. If you find that the problem is from the valves, one of these techniques could be could work. If the problem is from a blockage in one of the arteries, then you may need a stent or you might need uh, a I have some stents. bypass. So I have some stents. Now, I'm sorry, one more question. Sure. Uh, is there, how to liquefy the blockages in the arteries? Is there any way? I know I mentioned some plavics, but plavics cannot be done forever, right? So the question is how to liquefy the plaques in the arteries. The, 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 yeah, the so actually, the plaques, we, um, the, typically the plaques in the arteries can't be liquefied. Um, we've done stu cannot. We've done studies with uh, Lipitor and those medications, and we've seen if we bring the cholesterol really low, if we bring the triglyceride really low, does it reduce the plaques in the arteries? Does it liquefy them, as you put it? And the answer is no, not really. Um, but there are treatments for it. There's surgery you can do, there's stents that you can do. Um, Plavix, just make sure that the stents stay open so that they don't form clots. How would you verify that? Mine is about two years. How would I know if the is working or there is not for the blockage? You would have symptoms. Typically, what happens is after a stent, symptoms would develop if there was a problem. If you don't, in the absence of symptoms, then the presumption is that your stent is working just fine. Any, any specific, uh, symptoms well, if it's a blockage in an artery, the symptoms would be chest pain. Chest. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a couple of questions. Um, it seems to me if you gave a, a patient uh, who is um, not at high risk the option of taking one or the other, don't they all take the non-invasive approach? Even though, even though you can't prove the longevity of durability. Um, so the question is, why doesn't everyone take the why doesn't everyone take the transcatheter yeah. approach? Um, so <clears throat> the answer comes on many levels. The first thing is that that um, the FDA and, and and Medicare haven't approved th this device for use in patients who are low risk. Oh. That would be a very off-label reason to use it, and and. The FDA is looking out for the patient. They do want to make sure that this stent that we're talking about made of stainless steel, if someone's low risk and they can live 30 years, 
will it last 30 years or will they have a sudden cardiac arrest from the valve? The other thing is that, you know, there is, I didn't get into all the details, but it, it, it doesn't come free. Nothing in life comes for free. There is a slightly increased risk of stroke with the procedure. So uh, compared to open heart surgery, slightly increased. Specifically, if the risk of stroke with open heart surgery is around 2%, Generally, the risk of stroke with these procedures is about 4%. So even though there's a 96% freedom from stroke, it's slightly higher than with open heart surgery. Now, those numbers are improving every day as we get newer devices and people uh, become develop more expertise. But there is a stroke rate that's higher with this procedure. And the reason relates to that point where we inflate that balloon and leave that valve behind when we do that and we push the old valve out of the way, all the buildup on that valve can sort of break off and flake off and go to your head and cause a stroke. And so that's specifically the reason. Do I envision a future, maybe a decade from now, where it replaces open heart surgery of the valve? I can see that. I can see it. By then we'll have enough data. By then we'll have multiple further iterations of the technology. And I believe that by then it's possible that we would be in that position. The length of time a patient is, is being operated on, is, that, is it very different for one or the other? The Good question. Um, generally speaking, open heart surgery for the aortic valve is about three hours. This procedure is probably about an hour and a half, two hours, so it's a little bit shorter. Um, it's a consideration, but overall, generally speaking, patients are never necessarily worse for the wear because they were in the operating room an extra hour or two. That's not necessarily correlated, you know, in terms of uh, outcomes. But it is a shorter procedure. That's a good question. Can you put two stents in during the one surgery? If, in the, if a person in two or three, and we're talking about it in three separate surgeries? Yeah. Yes, it can be done. I mean, I, I'm not sure specifically, um, you know, the question is, can you put one in more than one of these in at a time? The answer is yes. Uh, sometimes you put one of these in and you blow it up and you don't like the position, so you go back in and put another one in, right inside of that other one. So that would be two stents. And the second time around, you position it a little differently. So it can be done. Uh, and can you do more than one of these valves at once? You can, we try not to. So that, you know, it's sort of less of an insult on the patient's <clears throat> system. Is there an age limit for the operation? Good question, and the answer is absolutely no. No age limit. Is there an age limit? I'm sorry, the question is, is there an age limit the answer is no. Uh, we recently did this procedure on someone who was uh, eight, 10 weeks shy of her 101st birthday. Okay? And she came in to, and we took a bunch of pictures with her after she turned 101. <laughs> Absolutely no age limit. What about people who have had chemo and radiation? Sure. And uh, their, uh, their arteries are very uh, fragile. Yes. Uh, that actually is a group of patients who would be better served by this technology than by open heart surgery. Yeah, absolutely. It, the, the technology is made for people like that. Yeah. Does uh, you get an aortic valve replacement? Does that affect? Uh, two questions. Does that affect the ejection fraction of your heart? And also, if a person had uh, prior uh, bypass surgery, say triple bypass surgery. Does that affect uh, the treatment? Great question. So generally speaking, if you leave the valve alone as it gets tighter and tighter, that will make your ejection fraction worse. The question is, is your ejection fraction, meaning the pumping ability of the heart, affected by this procedure? If you leave it alone, your ejection fraction or the pumping ability of the heart will get worse because the heart's got to work so hard to pump the blood when it's tight. Doing the procedure helps to preserve your ejection fraction. It doesn't hurt your ability to pump. Having had prior bypass surgery is no problem. In fact, in some ways it's desirable because you have lots of arteries coming from higher up on the aorta so you don't worry about their proximity to where you're working. So that's a good question. No, neither are, are, are big issues. Uh, what about anesthesia? Yes. Uh, do you use the same anesthesia? Yes. Do we use the same anesthetics in, in both types of surgeries? We do. Uh, patients are under general anesthesia. You know, currently, 
the, the standards that we use for anesthesia are very well tolerated by patients, very well tolerated. We are never in a situation where we say, the patient would have been fine if it weren't for the anesthesia. The anesthesia is, is great for the procedure, whether it's with the catheter or surgery, and afterwards it wears off nicely. It really does. And so patients don't struggle with the anesthesia either way. What happens to patients who are allergic to certain anesthesia? Well, fortunately, they have a lot of a, a lot of tools in their chest. They can they can resort to other types of anesthetics, and and sometimes patients do react uh, to the anesthetics. You know, they're more sensitive to the anesthetics. But the you know my anesthesia colleagues do a very good job of sort of titrating, you know, to the patient's tolerance, so that there aren't allergic reactions and that sort of thing. Under, uh, one reads about uh, uh, what I'll call pumping problems. Yes. Um, with the heart lung machine, they used to be problems of that sort. Now you've avoided the heart lung machine. That would seem to be a great advantage. Or is it, has it been eradicated altogether anyway? So this is a great question regarding, the question is, is there a quote unquote pump head phenomenon, which is a reaction to being on the cardiopulmonary bypass machine? Um, I'll give a little bit, a slightly more thorough answer. The, um, the traditionally, cardiopulmonary bypass, certainly 20, 30 years ago when it wasn't understood as well, um, did leave patients in the first initial post-operative period somewhat sleepy, maybe somewhat delirious, just sort of, a, you know, it took them a while to recover their mental acuity. Um, a lot has transpired over the past 20 or 30 years and I will tell you that that doesn't happen ever anymore. And there are a lot of reasons for it. We make sure that the flows of the cardiopulmonary bypass pump are adequate for your entire body, including your head, your arms, your legs, and everything. We also maintain a reasonable blood pressure for you during the course of the operation. The initial thoughts 30 years ago was that you don't need to worry about blood pressure as much as you need to worry about flow when you're doing these surgeries. So if I gave you for your body five liters of flow, that should be fine. It doesn't matter what the blood pressure is. What we had learned with time was that that led to some of the things that you're talking about. If you maintain a blood pressure and flow, then the artery regulation system of the brain is more appropriate. And so after surgery, you don't have any delirium or, or, or mental acuity issues whatsoever. So generally speaking, it has been, um, over the course of the past 10 or 15 years, um, uh, it's become a non-issue. It's been debunked in some ways. Uh, but I will tell you that, yes, avoiding cardiopulmonary bypass definitely, you know, endorses this procedure. Absolutely, because cardiopulmonary bypass requires significant amounts of blood thinner. It's non-pulsatile flow, meaning it's not like you can feel a blood pressure, you know, the wave of your heartbeat or your pulse. It's continuous flow. Sometimes the kidneys don't like it. Sometimes the liver doesn't like it, okay, because it's non-physiologic. Um, and there are a lot of effects that can come from the heart-lung machine. Uh, I would say they're at an absolute minimum, and it's certainly more invasive to do, uh, but it's, it's tolerated. However, why not take the option that doesn't need it at all? You know. Did you have a question also? Yeah, well, I have a question. Should a person that has a congestive heart failure, should he go through the valve, try out on the valve, and or the surgery. So the question is, if you have congestive heart failure, do you go through traditional surgery or do you do this, this procedure? I, I think that um, it, it completely depends on what you have as an individual patient. If you're concerned, for example, that you have some congestive heart failure, um, it would be good to find the cause of that. And one of the things that you would do is the ultrasound of the heart to take a look. To make an echocardiogram to make sure that the heart muscle is okay, to make sure the valves are okay. You check an EKG. You do the usual workup until we can pinpoint the exact problem. If we find that the problem is one of the valves, then you treat it, you know, in a way that's amenable for you. Whether it's the catheter procedure, open heart, whatever it is. If it's something with a blockage of one of the arteries, then we treat that differently. But I think if uh, if someone has symptoms, then EKG, some blood work, physical exam, and echocardiogram can be very helpful in diagnosing the problem. So, okay. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, in monitoring the uh, 
the evolution of the disease, uh, how often should an EKG be performed? That's a very good question. How often should te really testing be performed? Someone who has a, um, a problem with the heart valve should be under the care of a physician, should see the physician regularly, and depending on how much, it, how progressive it's been, should undergo an echocardiogram at least once a year. Some patients we recommend every six months, some patients even every three months, but at least once a year to monitor the, the progression of the disease. And it brings up a point that I mentioned before that's worth reiterating is that none of these things get better really with medicine or with exercise or with diet. Believe me, I wish I could tell you run up and down the stairs 10 times a day and it'll get better. It doesn't work that way. You know, I, I wish I could tell you don't eat pizza and the number will get better. That works for cholesterol some, it doesn't work for the valves. And so you have to monitor it. When we treat, what we're treating is the symptoms, really. If you're short of breath, we give you a water pill. That treats the symptoms, it doesn't change the valve. Right. And so just continuous careful monitoring makes a big difference so that we can decide before it becomes too late when it's appropriate to intervene. Even checking the, uh, <coughs> the uh, stents, okay, sometimes it goes ago. That's right. Well, again, if you have symptoms and you, you, know, you have had prior stents, your physician will get an EKG and make sure that, you know, everything's okay. If you have a uh, micro valve repair as opposed to replacement, you know, big valve or something like that, um, in a pretty well-functioning heart, how long does it last? Should it last forever or what? That's a good question. The, so how long with a, will a valve replacement last? No, not replacement. Oh, repair. repair, sorry. How long will a repair last? The intention with the repairs is always, when we evaluate the valve, we look at it and we say, can we fix this thing with a durable long-term outlook? Or if we fix it, is it going to fail again somewhere else on the valve in a couple of years? Our goal is always 15 to 20 years when we repair. So sometimes when you look at the valve, it's just the one hinge that needs a little oil or something. We do that and the rest of the valve looks perfect. He's going to be fine for 20 years. That's what we want. Sometimes we look at the valve and the immediate problem is that hinge and we can fix that hinge, but the other hinge is falling apart. You know, there's a hole in the middle of the door there. You know, it's, it's off its axis, you know, and you realize that you might be able to fix one thing, but the rest of it's not gonna last more than five, six, seven, eight years. And so that's not really an acceptable outcome. In that case, we might consider doing a replacement because we don't want you to come back in a couple years. Question, uh, based on my own experience, and I, I hate to get personal on this thing, but um, since open heart, I've had open heart surgery and repair many years ago, but I've had AFib ever since. Never had it before. And a very strong open pulse before. Very high. Is that is that common? So, uh, so atrial fibrillation, as as sort of coming in conjunction with mitral valve disease, is very common. Okay, it sounds like you didn't have it before. And the reason that happens is because when that valve leaks, the mitral valve, when it leaks, it leaks back into your atrium. And the first thing the atrium does when it sees all that extra volume is it enlarges to accommodate that extra volume. And when it enlarges, the side effect of that enlargement is that it becomes more likely to have an arrhythmia. So when you have a leaky valve, you have a normal sized chamber, but when it leaks, the first thing the body does to accommodate that leak is enlarge. When it enlarges, now it's more likely to have an electrical arrhythmia. So even though you've changed out the valve, that atrium, that chamber is still enlarged. And at some point in there, you had some AFib. And, and you know, it's generally benign. You have to take Coumadin for it. I'm sure you're taking Coumadin or, you know, that's the problem. But otherwise, it's relatively benign. Um, as a post-operative phenomenon, we see it in about 40 or 50 percent of patients immediately after surgery, regardless of the type of surgery patients have. You know, it's just related to inflammation and that sort of thing, and a lot of times it's self-limited, it goes away. But in the setting of someone who's had mitral valve disease, whose atrial chamber is already enlarged, it can come and stay. Yeah. What percentage of men, say in their 70s, would you say have uh, calcification? in the, uh, to some extent, of, of the uh, aortic? Good question, 5%. That's all? That's 5%, okay? 5% have some degree of aortic sclerosis, 
okay? But the progression to aortic stenosis, somewhere around 15 to 50% of those patients. Yeah. Okay. Very good. I, this was very, very good. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, yeah. Dr. Yeah. Fleming. We appreciate yeah. it. Yeah.